Hello, this is April 28, 2018, and you're joining us for the last in our series of classes on what is the new paradigm. I'm Jason Ross, and I'll be hosting the class here with my colleague Ben Denniston. For today's presentation, we're very happy to have a special guest on with us, Helga Tsepp LaRouche, the founder and chairwoman of the Schiller Institute. She's going to be helping us talk through the objectives of this class series, which have been to develop a greater power at ending geopolitics and making the new paradigm a reality. We're also fortunate to have on with us audiences in Manhattan and in Houston, including uh, Keisha Rogers there in Houston. And we're going to be hearing from some more people around the country by telephone and around the world also by email. The classes so far, we've had three months of a discussion that's run the whole gamut from what is geopolitics, what's the world situation right now, is a conflict between the new paradigm represented by China's Belt and Road Initiative, by the World Land Bridge outlook of cooperation promoted by the Schiller Institute, versus the geopolitical outlook of the British Empire. We've had classes on the history of geopolitics, on the philosophy of geopolitics, on the thoughts in your mind that have been placed there in order to maintain a geopolitical outlook. And we've heard about alternatives. We've looked at the potential for cooperation among the cultures of East and West. We've gotten a better understanding of Confucianism as a cultural current within China and its connections with ideas in the Western Renaissance. We've learned about music as a cultural expression and how it can improve people's power to think creatively. And we've discussed the role of science in economics and in bringing people together. For today's discussion, the objective is to wrap all this together and talk about how each of us is going out and making this a reality. So we've got a number of responses that came into the homework, which we're very happy about. And the way we're going to start this off is, given the incredible developments that took place in uh, took place in Korea yesterday, I'd like to start by just saying a little bit about that, and then asking Helga Tsepp-Larouche to open up the discussion with any reflections she has on what occurred in Korea and anything else she'd like to do to set the stage for the discussion. So yesterday, as I'm sure many people saw in the footage, the presidents of North Korea, Kim Jong-un, and President Moon of South Korea met at the Peace Village. They met at the demilitarized zone line there. They took turns walking into each other's countries. Um, Kim Jong-un stepped into South Korea, and then they held hands and walked the other direction and both stepped into North Korea. It was a very, very positive development. One of the most powerful things about this was the signing of a very significant and very jubilant outlook towards peace, which I'd like to read just a few quotes from before we hear from Helga Tsepp LaRouche. In the declaration signed there at, at Panmunjom Peace House, this was called the Declaration for the Peace, Prosperity, and Reunification of the Korean Peninsula. And here are a few quotations from it. Both delegations have made clear to the world and the 80 million Korean people that a new era of peace has begun and that there will be no war on the Korean Peninsula. One, North and South Korea will move forward with self-reunification efforts via complete and innovative reformation and development for joint prosperity and a reconnection of our people's divided bloodlines. There are more details. I'm just reading the section headings. Two, North and South Korea will make a joint effort to relieve military tension and to realistically resolve the threat of war. Three, North and South Korea will actively cooperate in order to build a permanent and stable system of peace. North Korea and South Korea will, this year, on the 65th anniversary of the Korean Armistice Agreement, announce the end of the Korean War. We will change the Armistice Agreement to an agreement of peace. North and South Korea have confirmed both sides' intent for the denuclearization of the Korean Peninsula. The declaration concludes, both delegations will maintain regular meetings and direct lines of communication to discuss matters regarding the people, thereby building trust in each other, and have agreed to work together 
to increase momentum towards peace, prosperity, reunification, and development of the Korean Peninsula. This is how the declaration concludes. So I think that we would all be very interested in hearing from Helga Tsef LaRouche what this recent development means in the context of a ending geopolitics and bringing in a new paradigm. So Helga, what, what can you say about these incredible developments of yesterday for our viewers? Well, I'm actually a specialist on German unification, but I think it's a, a very, very good development because obviously the North Korea, South Korea conflict was until this happened, one of the potential trigger points for a huge potentially even global catastrophe. And I think that the two leaders of North and South Korea, uh, obviously being aware that they had been a pawn in the geopolitical game, which was really uh, directed against China and Russia, I think they outflanked this geopolitical faction. And, you know, it's a very happy moment because they have now agreed you know, to <clears throat> establish various kinds of cooperation, to go back to the Kaesung uh, industrial development projects. They will have a rail line in the East Coast and on the West Coast, or, you know, basically connecting to the Russian uh, <clears throat> railway, Trans-Siberian railway, and to the Chinese old Silk Road uh, railway connection. So they will be integrated uh, very soon in the whole uh, Belt and Road uh, initiative. So this is a very, very positive development. And I think it is the spirit of the new Silk Road, which by the way, I mean, <clears throat> I want to say that this is not the only uh, really e excellent uh, development because at the same time you had a summit, an informal summit, less glamorous, but also extremely important between <clears throat> uh, Xi Jinping and Nahendra Modi, uh, the Prime Minister from India. They met for two days in, I think, altogether six discussions in Wuhan. And <clears throat> there they agreed also that the two countries will cooperate on the China-Nepal-India uh, corridor uh, and on many, uh, many other projects. And very, very good is that uh, today it was announced that one of their first joint projects will be a joint development project in Afghanistan. Now, this is fantastic because that means uh, that the wish of the Afghanistan government to have the new Silk Road extended into Afghanistan uh, is actually now becoming uh, <clears throat> a reality. And, you know, I, I'm proud to say that three years ago when I attended the Raisina dialogue in New Delhi, that was exactly the point I made in my speech that India should play a special role together with Russia and China in the development of Afghanistan and the whole region from Afghanistan to the Mediterranean, from the, <clears throat> uh, you know, from the Russian border to the Gulf states, taking this region as a whole. So I think that, you know, if India and China, who are the two largest countries and as one Chinese professor just said, you know, they are the only two countries who are in the club of nations who have more than one billion people. Uh, namely that the two of them have 2.6 billion people and that is 40% of all the human population. If these two countries are now moving closer together, it also means that the geopolitical game to play the so-called Indo-Pacific meaning Australia, <clears throat> New Zealand, uh, India, and Japan, as a counter to the new Silk Road, obviously is not functioning. And you know, while the tensions between India and Pakistan still exist, and India is still hesitant to uh, cooperate fully with the Belt and Road because of this corridor from China to Pakistan, this is possible to be overcome because Afghanistan you know, is very close to Pakistan. And obviously, Afghanistan is sort of in the backyard of India and has always been one of the major security concerns of India. So China, on the other side, has a better relation with Pakistan. 
And there you can actually see the principle of how the win-win cooperation uh, and the new paradigm is helping to overcome potentially and you know very fast all problems of the past. So I think if you take these two developments together, the uh, potential for uh, uh, peaceful cooperation and potential even unification of the two Koreas and the fact that the two largest uh, countries in the world, China and India, are clearly moving towards each other for closer cooperation. I think this makes the world a much better place in, in all these days. So I'm really happy. Well, thanks. Thanks so much for that that opening, Helga. It's certainly great to have an optimistic piece of news, and this, this is a wonderful one. I'd like to go right to a question that came in online via responses to the homework. And um, so these are people who have been making the new paradigm, and they would like to get your input on how to do it. So let's. Uh, this is a response from a participant in the USA, and I'm going to go ahead and read what this person wrote in. He wrote in that I have he wrote, I have found a serious resistance in most people whom I have approached individually about the Belt and Road Initiative. Let's, uh, let's get that text up on the screen, please. Mostly, people hold to old beliefs about China and what they've been taught to think about Russia. But when I spoke to one person this morning, she spoke like the others. But when I began to say more about the steady progress of the work in relation with 140 countries throughout the world, the response was, I never heard that before. I've written articles called Viewpoints for our regional newspaper on various topics, which got some response. So I'll start with that and seek to engage in further conversations with others and perhaps in other ways. It will be important to emphasize and to begin to describe the new paradigm, which so many have never heard of before. This may touch into their hidden or repressed hopes and begin to deliver some encouragement that will arouse them from their doldrums and their submission to what is, as what could be, comes alive and is already visibly underway in so many different parts of our beleaguered world. Helga, could you comment on what difference you think it makes in terms of organizing that there is so much success now with the Belt and Road Initiative, that this people are able to point to more things as a success of this outlook? Well, I think that the new Silk Road is a genie uh, which has escaped the bottle and cannot be put back into it simply because, you know, I mean, if you think what the new Silk Road has done for the countries which participate, I mean, up to that point, um, you know, except of certain other economic deals which China and some other countries had, but for the most part, Latin America, uh, Africa, most part of Asia, you know, they were really denied the kind of development perspective which the Belt and Road Initiative is offering. And this is the first time that the countries of the developing countries have the perspective of overcoming poverty and underdevelopment in a very fast speed because China is you know, not dishing out old technologies, old industries, but bringing these countries on board to participate in joint space programs, in other advanced uh, <clears throat> scientific enterprises, so that people realize that there is a completely different perspective and the chance you know, that the idea to overcome poverty on the planet uh, is becoming a reality very, very quickly. So the news of that is spreading, maybe even quicker than the projects. So you have Latin America uh, on board, you have Africa in a complete explosion of uh, more optimistic future uh, plans. The same goes even for much of Europe, the 16 plus one East and Central European countries, the Balkan states, Southern, the Southern European states, Italy, Spain, Portugal, they all want to be part of it. So even the countries which are still, you know, putting the brake on, like unfortunately Germany, uh, Great Britain, uh, the EU in Brussels, uh, nevertheless, you know, the news are spreading and, you know, it's sort of coming over the border 
And I think the United States has so many ethnic Americans, Asian Americans, uh, you know, people from, from Latin America. I think it cannot be contained. And after all, you know, the hand is, is uh, 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 stuck out by, by President Xi Jinping for Trump. And Trump keeps saying, you know, that Xi Jinping is his very good friend. And despite all of these problems with tariffs and trade imbalances, I think that it really is a moment where I would think that in the next several months, if we find enough people who are willing to, you know, help our efforts, that we can actually crack this problem and that the United States and maybe even Germany, which I think is an even harder nut than, than the United States, can be brought to join the new paradigm. So I think, you know, the, the, this is a, an optimistic uh, spirit which is catching on. And, you know, once people know it, as you have, uh, as you have seen in your own experience, you know, people really are completely transformed because it's the lack of a vision for the future which causes people to have depressions, to take drugs, to be despaired. But once they know that there is an absolutely beautiful other perspective, you know, I think it speaks to the very good human nature and people, you know, can be convinced, maybe not all of them, there will be always some neocons and some hardcore oligarchical nuts. Uh, but I think the majority of people can, can be educated in the next period very, very quickly. Well, let's turn our attention to some more activity to make just that happen here in the United States. I, we've got a, a couple of candidates that we have some comments from here. I know that we've got Keisha Rogers down in Texas, and we also have uh, Ron Wysorek in South Dakota. As a reminder to everybody on the conference call system, on the telephone system, if you would like to ask a question, please press star six so that we can see that you're in the queue of questioners. So let's now turn to Keisha Rogers in Texas, and then we will hear from Ron Wysorek in South Dakota. So Keisha. I was just actually uh, talking right now with a constituent who um, was just very excited about the developments that are going on uh, in the world. And I think what we've done with this campaign to win the future is proven to be absolutely critical to get an understanding from the American people that they have to think about the bigger picture of moving toward the mass movement, as you call for, of development, Helga, because there's a, a lot of people that we're running into here with the campaign. And so I'm running as an independent for running as an independent for Congress in the 9th Congressional District of Texas, which is now the seat of Congressman Al Green here. One of the things that being in Texas that we're finding is that people are still suffering from the developments of what happened over nine months ago with Hurricane Harvey. But they also are seeing that there's now a shift going on in the world where they can find hope, they can find optimism because of our campaign for building the future, for bringing the United States into the new paradigm. This seeing what the developments that were just expressed between what happened in Korea it's not just something that's distant over in another country, but it's really showing that right now, everything that our campaign represents for bringing the American people into this new future is well underway. And I think that right now with the campaign to win the future, the four laws for LaRouche's four laws for economic development is becoming uh, is actually taking off in a way that we could not have imagined. Uh, where I just had a lady to come in now, I apologize because I missed a few minutes of the discussion because she said, I had to come and find you. I saw my husband sign the petition for you to get on the ballot yesterday. I don't know who you are, but uh, I looked you up online and I looked up your campaign and uh, your husband, she said that my husband told her, go to our office 
uh, sign the petition and get involved in the campaign. And so a lady who just, her husband met us yesterday and brought the card home of our platform and read it and then said, go over there and support this young lady and support their campaign. So uh, that's the kind of impact that we're having right now. And I think uh, that the American people are absolutely ready for this mass movement for development. And if you want to say more on that, uh, I think that that's what's going to really draw the excitement toward ending this culture of geopolitics of warfare, of economic collapse, financial distress, and actually letting the American people know that we are intent on winning this campaign for the future. And as our platform says, any candidate that's running that's actually serious cannot run on a party platform or an allegiance to a party per se, but have to actually run on the platform that they're going to commit again to uh, the economic progress and development of the American people. And that's what the American people are ready for right now. There's too much suffering going on, too much distress, and people are seeing that there's a new direction, um, more and more people being educated on the new paradigm of the Belt and Road, New Silk Road Initiative, and what this means for the Amer American people. And lastly, I'll just say that in that context, with everything erupting around the exposure of this coup, you can tell that the serious leaders are coming out and saying, why are we focused so much on something that there's no evidence for whatsoever? Russia gate, colluding with Russia, uh, going after the president of the United States. How is this actually addressing the needs of the American people? So I think that right now we're in a very, uh, beautiful opportunity and moment for the nation and for the uh, for the world so i'll just stop with those comments as initiation well i think i think what is very clear is the the battle for uh what trump will do is not yet totally decided i mean the problem is you know i mean i'm i'm still of the opinion that if Trump will reach out with Putin. He's scheduled to have a summit very soon and, you know, establishes a good relationship between Russia and China. Uh, you have the four power agreement. Uh, Lyndon LaRouche has been calling for, you know, for many years. And he always said that the only way to overcome geopolitics, if the four largest nations, Russia, China, India, and the United States work together. And we are very, very close to that. Now, in the same time, uh, one has to state that you know the danger is not completely eliminated, as you could see that there was this push uh, leading to a military strike against Syria on the 14th of April, which is against international law, and we should not be, uh, you know, we should not uh, <clears throat> not say that because this is the danger point that. You have some kind of a provocation and, you know, the conflict with Syria, with Russia uh, can be uh, refocused. So, you know, when I say that we need a mass movement for development, well, I mean, that is exactly what will counter it. Because once the people who have voted for Trump or even have changed their mind, um, you know, after he got into the presidency and who have recognized the perfidiousness of this coup attempt, you know, uh, against him, and therefore, you know, basically at least take a neutral position. Um, so this is not yet decided. Um, you have the defeat of the Russia Gate. Uh, Trump tweeted today saying that after the House Intelligence Committee basically said uh, there was no collusion, that there should never have been a special prosecutor, and the witch hunt must stop. So this is very good. But, you know, the, the dark stain is this military strike against Syria, because this was based on no evidence. The evidence does not exist. Everything speaks in, in, um, in the direction that it was a provocation by the jihadists, uh, which are run by the British uh, intelligence. And obviously, 
you know, I mean, I think it is really very important that this whole, I mean, Trump in his campaign and even afterwards said many times, these wars uh, based on interventionist humanitarian pretexts, the right to protect humanitarian interventions uh, in the Middle East, they cost $7 trillion. They cost millions of lives. They cost post-traumatic disorders in many of the veterans who went to Afghanistan, to Iraq, to, to other places. Uh, so, you know, I think that there needs to be a healing, a national healing uh, of this because, you know, I mean, this is this has done damage not only to the countries of the Middle East uh, wars, which were based on lies by Bush, by Cheney, by Obama, uh, but, you know, it did a lot to the soul of America as well. So I think that, you know, patriotic Americans, both, you know, uh, people who are completely Americans since many generations, but also so-called hyphenated Americans, uh, coming from these countries, from, you know, Indian Americans, Chinese Americans, Asian Americans of all uh, kinds, they must be mobilized to make sure that the great infrastructure development, which China has given as an example, can be brought to the United States. And for that, we need more people who say we will fight to get this kind of, uh, you know, development also inside the United States. I mean, Modi, a couple of years ago, uh, pointed to the fact that the great advantage of India is that 65% of all Indians are below the age of 30 years. And while that is demographically not the case for the United States, nevertheless, you can have a, a youth movement, people who are fighting to have a kind of future. So I would call on all of you to make that happen and get such a movement, which you can do once you have multipliers and people who represent different groupings who then can uh, demand the implementation of the United States joining with the Belt and Road and the implementation of the four laws. But I think, you know, we are at an incredible moment. And once people feel that, and the North Korea, South Korea, developments, the China-India developments. I mean, these are, you know, these are extraordinary periods where the subjective intervention makes the difference because the objective potential is clearly there. Hmm. Well, uh, let's, uh, let's hear from some more activity about making this happen. Our next two questions are both from congressional candidates, one from South Dakota and one from New York. So we're going to turn now to Ron Wysorek, who is connected via our, an audio hookup. Ron, are you there? Hi, Hello, Ron. Jason. Hello, hey. Helga. So how's it going in South Dakota, Ron? Well, well, we've had a, a, I'm running for U.S. Congress on the independent ticket, and we've had two and a half months of gathering signatures since I announced that I was going to run. And... Yeah. Uh, uh, as Helga said, the genie has escaped the bottle, and uh, I think the people are, are really picking up on the spirit, um, and people are responding. Uh, I, I think of the activists, uh, the volunteers that help gain, uh, you know, uh, or uh, uh, gather almost um, 4,000 signatures here, and uh, uh, the response of the, the public uh, has been overwhelmingly uh, accepting Lynn's ideas. Uh, we've been putting out a uh, flyer here that uh, has Lynn's program on the front of it. So people actually, uh, before they even sign the uh, petition, they, they have been given a flyer. So they know that I stand for LaRouche's programs. And uh, uh, I, it's been very well recepted. I've even had people that objected to the LaRouche name on the ticket after reading the flyer and, and gathering an understanding of, uh, of uh, Lynn's program, which they apparently didn't have, and they were only going by gossip and, uh, uh, you know, misinformation, uh, come back and want to sign the petition because, or the, uh, yeah, the petition because uh, they agreed with everything that Lynn was talking about in the flyer. So uh, 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 I think uh, we're on to something uh, in the uh, heartland here. Uh, with uh, LaRouche's programs, um, 
Uh, people, uh, you know, really seem to be open to the ideas. Uh, they're looking for solutions. They respond uh, to the activists very well, uh, uh, you know, to the petition gathers very well. We, um, uh, you know, we're uh, actually we set up a table uh, on a weekend in, in, in a flea market and got 508 signatures in two days uh, just at the table alone. Um, uh, the, the response was overwhelming. Uh, then we were gathering signatures, you know, in front of the courthouse and um, uh, <clears throat> people had come up that had gotten petitions uh, or, or had gotten a flyer before and uh, had questions uh, about the flyer. So I think, uh, you know, I've been looking at it now as more of an educational process than a, as the electoral thing. And when we turned in our signatures here um, uh, this, this past week, why... We had unbelievable uh, coverage in, in practically all the major papers in South Dakota, the major daily papers in South Dakota. We had three radio stations that played uh, question and answer uh, uh, comments that I had made and they had recorded. And uh, uh, we had uh, some TV coverage. I see there was even an article in the Seattle paper uh, on our campaign here in South Dakota. I, I got, you know, I was overwhelmed with the coverage we got and the response we got from the local media. So I think there's a real sense, uh, you know, even though um, we've had a, a, an unusually cold, wet spring here in, in the Midwest, and uh, the collapsing grain prices, of course, have have pushed people to uh, be a little more anxious uh, and uh, probably had a little more time to think about the situation as, as our economy continues to collapse and deteriorate. So when, when you lay out this pamphlet in front of these people and see hope, I mean, it's just, it's, to me, it's wonderful to watch these people respond and, uh, uh, you know, uh, look at a 75 year old guy that's running. Of course, Linda LaRouche would say, uh, I'm just a kid and I got a hell of a lot to learn. But uh, I think uh, we're, we're uh, really moving people, and that's what has to be done. We have to move the people because the people are the ones that are going to make the change. And I really don't have a question uh, other than, you know, any ideas that would help us do a better job here in South Dakota representing Lynn's program. I can't, we can't hear Helga. Oh, you can't hear me? What happened? You have to call it. You have no, to call it. Everything's oh. fine. Go ahead. It works. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I, I was saying that, you know, um, I, I think that we need to find people who come to South Dakota and help you. Uh, so I'm actually, you know, uh, making an appeal to everybody who is listening, uh, instead of doing a vacation to Hawaii or some other place, why don't you go for a couple of weeks to either Texas to help Keisha or to help Ron Vizurek? Um, I think that that would really boost the whole thing. So I'm appealing to you to do that. Good. Well, let's, uh, it's a nice, this, and this is a nice time of year to go, isn't it? <laughs> so let's uh, turn next to Manhattan. Let's see if the audio, I believe we had a little bit of a problem before, but let's see if it's working. Let's get a question from our congressional candidate in New York who has a, a question for, for Helga Tsepp LaRouche here. I can't hear him. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh -oh. It looks. Yes, I'm sorry. The audio audio isn't working. This is. Um... Oh, I'm sorry. I'll I'll read your question there. This is uh, Sander Hicks. He is a Democratic candidate for U.S. Congress in New York's 12th congressional district in New York City, and his question is: How can we affect a paradigm shift in U.S. foreign policy in Yemen? We are backing the Saudi oligarchy and killing civilians. What can we do to change U.S. policy towards Yemen? Well, I mean, there are many things you you can do. Uh, one is, you know, 
um, the 9-11 involvement of Saudi Arabia, which is now uh, <clears throat> a subject of a court case in New York. Um, I think you should probably talk to the people who are launching this uh, suit against Saudi Arabia and get them involved because it is really urgent. You know, the, the crisis is the biggest humanitarian crisis on the planet. I think 7 million people's lives are in danger. And, you know, it is actually a, an unbelievable crime that the whole world knows about it. Um, and, you know, nothing is really done uh, to, to stop this. As a matter of fact, the uh, acting president of uh, Yemen was just assassinated with a directed drone coming from, from Saudi Arabia or, or some kind of a missile attack. So uh, I think that, you know, people have to be rebel roused that, you know, when, when the Holocaust happened, people at least could say, you know, or it's doubtful, you know, who knew what, when, but this is different because, you know, this is known. It's known uh, that because of the blockade of the food and, and the medicine, uh, cholera and other uh, epidemics have been spreading, killing a lot of people. And right now, the Red Cross warned that you have a complete collapse of infrastructure in Yemen, um, water, sewage, just everything. So uh, I can tell you that we are right now, uh, some of our colleagues, um, uh, are working on a new development program for Yemen. And we will plan to uh, put this out and hopefully we will find uh, support in Yemen uh, of people we are working with already, but you know that they really can put this on the agenda. And it will be an extension of the new Silk Road, the report which the Schiller Institute put out um, basically as a sequel to the World Land Bridge Report, uh, the new Silk Road coming to West Asia and Africa, but it will be uh, much more elaborated, something like a 70 page study, which we will probably pu put out within a week or so. And we will also feature that at European conferences. And I think that, you know, once we have such a concrete development perspective, we can do an enormous outreach. We can, you know, approach uh, different organizations in the United Nations and really make a rebel rousing case that, you know, both the uh, blocking of Saudi Arabia's support, which there is a bill in the Congress uh, already, uh, but combined with such a reconstruction of Yemen. Because once people know that there is a way of, of you know, reconstructing the whole region. You know, now with Afghanistan, the Syria uh, reconstruction is on the agenda. And there again, you know, you see the absolute disgusting hy hypocrisy uh, of the European Union, for example, who basically had a conference in Paris where they said they will uh, put in a little bit of money, not, not, not much, for the reconstruction of Syria, but only those territories which are not under the control of the Assad uh, government. So all of this hangs together because, you know, once you get the perspective of India, China and Russia and Iran working on the reconstruction of Syria, uh, then you can also find a similar combination for Yemen. But we need obviously in the United States a lot of organizing for it. Uh, the crimes of Saudi Arabia, the absolute uh, need to stop weapon sales to Saudi Arabia, uh, and at the same time, you know, to, to really make this genocide known and also the solution. We need people, you know, to, to amplify that because, you know, this is, this is a, a crime against humanity which is taking place in front of our eyes. But if you look at the courage of the people in Yemen who, you know, have been despite the bombings and the you know, missiles flying in, they have been studying uh, Linz economics. They studied our World Land Bridge report. We have people who you know, are, are absolutely enthusiastic. So the spirit of the people in Yemen uh, is, 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 is very, very good. And the more people in Yemen find out that there are people outside who are taking on their case you know, the better are the chances to turn this around in the short term. Because as I said, 
we are in a moment of history, you know, where the large powers, and especially China, uh, <clears throat> Russia, and now, as it seems, uh, India, uh, and also altogether 140 countries working in this dynamic, the objective conditions to, to change things are clearly there. But it is one of these moments, you know, where, as Schiller said, you know, concerning the French Revolution, that with the objective condition, you need the subjective factor. And that means we need a lot of people who take the responsibility as world historical individuals and don't sit on the fence and just watch it, but become active because every single person who is now uh, getting mobilized in those countries which are still not on board, it makes the huge difference. So my absolute appeal is to you to 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 do that. And um, you know, I think if you help us to publish this Yemen report once it's out, to lobby Congress to put pressure on them uh, to stop this genocide, to you know, play up the role of Saudi Arabia. Uh, in 9/11, which you know is still the the big uh, wound in in the hist in the recent history of the United States, all of these things have to come together, and I think we can really turn this around. You know, Yemen is really an amazing case study. The Schiller Institute, the LaRouche representatives in Yemen, who have recently had been victims of online attacks of losing their ability to communicate. They have taken such an optimistic view of what the Silk Road will look like and what that will mean for Yemen, that in very difficult conditions that I believe most of us here cannot not even really imagine, they are keeping firmly and beautifully in mind what Yemen could be. And I think it's a great inspiration for us to take. For our next question, we're going to turn to something that came in as an online response to our homework. And following that, we will go to Texas for a live question. As a reminder, if you're on the telephone line listening in and you would like to ask a question, please press star six so that we know that you would like to speak up. So the next question that we'll take from an online submission, this came in from a friend of ours in Algeria. He wrote in that I am very happy to know about this project, which aims to build a world of peace and justice. I have been so convinced that geopolitical conflict is the origin of the international order, but the new paradigm is a deep will to build a system based on recognition, development, and diplomacy. The project of One Belt, One Road is more than an economic project, but represents an argument of human creativity and human solidarity in the universe. I can contribute to support this new paradigm by one, I can get people to sign on as supporters of the platform. Two, I can spread the word by social media, Facebook or Twitter. Three, I can invite people over to my place or a library meeting room to watch a LaRouche Pack class or webcast. Four, I can translate the most important material into my language. I have already published a book review of the EIR report of 2014 on extending the World Land Bridge. I have published a book review in one of the most famous journals published by most think tanks in the Arab world, and I'm awaiting the publication of the second report in Arabic written by Hussein Askari and Jason Ross. I have begun translating a Leibniz essay into Arabic, and I wish to devote more time to translate the works of Nicholas of Cusa, who remains completely unknown in the Arab world. And last, he writes, five, I will work to convince the members of our research laboratory to make workshops or conferences to present the idea of the new paradigm and the initiative of One Belt, One Road. So this came in from a professor of political science in Algeria, and I think it represents the wide variety of activities that everybody can engage in to make the new paradigm a reality. Let's ask uh, Helga, do you have any response to uh, what this person wrote in with. <laughs> oh, I congratulate you. Um, I think this is fantastic because, you know, I think you can be a role model for many people around, you know, the world. I mean, that's the good thing that, you know, with the internet, with uh, <clears throat> modern communication, you know, we can really organize in every country in the world. I mean, there 
you know, in the past, it was a huge problem to go to Africa, for example, because it was in extremely expensive. The tickets were really horrendously out of uh, out of uh, reach. Um, you know, so to do a conference was a huge effort. But now, basically, I think we can have a network of people uh, who can, you know, be uh, internet based uh, universities who can you know outreach who can organize uh, classes like you know what we have been doing in latin america uh, repeatedly where we would have a conference and then we would have parallel uh, seminars with students with um, engineers with chambers of commerce with universities so i think i would encourage you that you know you help us to build up such a network in africa because you know africa right now is in a in a complete um, change you know where i mean the kind of infrastructure which was built railways from djibouti to addis abeba uh, from nairobi to rwanda then the fantastic transaqua project which now is officially on the line between china uh, and Italy and six countries of the Chad uh, <clears throat> Lake Chad region. Um, these are projects. They may take ten years or twelve years, as the main engineer of the Power China Engineering Company uh, said at a recent conference in in uh, Nigeria. But you know, Africa can be transformed in a few years from a country from a continent which you know has been full of refugees and people marching through the Sahara, dying, you know, to get to the Mediterranean, uh, to drown there, uh, and only few people would make it to Europe. I mean, this misery, this refugee crisis can be turned around in the short term. And we have seen a tremendous sense of optimism uh, coming from the African countries who no longer want to be a target of uh, Sunday uh, sermons by, by Europeans telling them, uh, to have good governance, but then not investing in any infrastructure, that because of the Chinese, but also now Indian and Japanese investments, uh, I mean, the Chinese have still the lion uh, part of it, but there is now a complete sense of change. So I think if you would line up with the many contacts we have, I think we can make this medium of communication a much more powerful instrument to influence events because you know i mean this is really uh, an unbelievable moment where the european policy which is still you know no development um, only talk about human rights and democracy but on the other side as you can see by the example of the italy cooperation with china there is the potential to turn it around and Spain and Portugal want to be hubs for uh, all the Spanish-speaking and Portuguese-speaking countries in Latin America, Asia, and Africa. So the idea of a mass movement for development, you know, can take completely new forms. And you uh, doing what you are doing uh, can be a role model for such a mass movement to spread very, very quickly. So I want to really congratulate for what you are doing. Yeah, thanks. This it really is a very inspiring message. Particularly, I mean, imagine the impact of Kuza finally becoming available in Arabic if it hasn't been yet. That's that's wonderful news for creating a real renaissance among cultures. For our next question, we are going to turn to Texas, and then we will turn to Manhattan after that. As a reminder, if you are viewing us, you can ask your questions via our course webpage or email at classes at larouchepack.com. And if you're in the telephone conference line and want to ask a question, press star six. So let's turn now to Texas. Howdy from Houston. <laughs> um, if, if there were any kind of uh, summit or meeting that could be more profound than what we just witnessed with uh, President Kim and President Moon uh, meeting in the um, demilitarized zone of the Koreas, uh, it would certainly be the coming together of Presidents Trump and Presidents Putin to shake hands and come to an understanding on the higher mission of mankind. Uh, 
including space, including counterterrorism, and a host of other things. Now, we know that um, President Trump has verbally committed to such a summit despite everything, but that date for that hasn't been set yet. But there has been a date set for a summit yeah. uh, in England, uh, in um, Great Britain in July, and I can't see anything good coming out of that. Uh, I mean, three weeks ago, I could not possibly have believed that President Trump would fall for the bait of um, attacking Syria again, based on exactly the same pretext as last uh, you know, a year ago. But something that the British did broke broke down its resistance to take this this destructive act. So, um, how can we actually uh, intervene? Uh, in, in the immediate period to make sure that that summit with, with President Putin has to happen first, in my imagination, and not let the British, you know, use their wily ways to screw everything up. Thank you. Well, I think that the best way uh, is if you, you know, help to educate the Trump voters um, because, you know, the problem is that many of the people who have voted for Trump for the right reasons um, still have been brainwashed on this um, demonization of Russia. Uh, I mean, even some of the very good, relatively good congressmen and senators who have been absolutely uh, focused on the fraud of Russia Gate, uh, who even have focused on the role of the British. Nevertheless, uh, when it secure the future. Uh, when it comes to the question of Russia, uh, they believe, unfortunately, all the garbage which is peddled by the mass media and and some of the Democrats and some of the neocons. So I think that you know the more <clears throat> so-called Trump supporters, people who, you know, are really happy that Trump you know, has not represented Wall Street, even if he has a lot of people from Wall Street in his administration, in cabinet posts. Uh, nevertheless, you know, I mean, there, there is still this question of prejudices against Russia. And I think that if some of the leaders from the Midwest, from, you know, other places, the so-called Rostbelt, if they would, you know, make it more, uh, loudly to be heard, that they demand that this summit takes place very quickly and, you know, that basically then you can create an environment where you can hopefully counter this danger that Trump is being, you know, manipulated into such actions. So, I, but I think right now, given the fact that the Russia gate is definitely off the table, uh, I think the potential to move this forward is definitely increased because you know it took uh, because of Russia Gate it took uh, seven months before Putin and Trump met the first time at the G20 summit in Hamburg uh, last year and you know then they had a very brief uh, encounter in in Vietnam but you know the real the summit has not yet taken place and you know I think that between the two of them I'm absolutely sure that you know they will absolutely outflank uh, the obstacles. But I think we need to create a public environment. And, you know, maybe if one makes a task force, you know, we already have a task force. Um, maybe you can attach yourself to it and help us to contact as many of the Trump networks, uh, Tea Party groups and, and other such institutions, you know, to, to really show the potential uh, which exists in the strategic situation. I think we have to work to create an environment of support for Trump to move in this direction and at the same time, you know, focus on the role of the British because, you know, I think that that is one of the key factors uh, to neutralize that. I mean, I think we should spread the uh, report which was put out by the Russian Foreign Ministry, uh, which Maria Sakharova uh, presented, uh, I think half of this report was on the historic role of the British, all the wars, uh, all the assassinations, all the fake news incidents of the Russian 
uh, British uh, of the British Empire against Russia, but also against other countries. And also the president of South Africa, Zuma, uh, in that context, almost the same day, is put out the story of British operations against South Africa. And then there is a very famous uh, Indian parliamentarian from the Congress party, uh, Taror, who made a very famous speech in Oxford University, University of all places, where he detailed the crimes of the British against India. So I think that to spread these materials, you know, so the, the role of the British is becoming clearer and it will not stop because the Skripal case, uh, you know, is still very much live in terms of who did that. Uh, the, the provocation uh, of the so-called blue white helmets making a, a stage scenario as a pretext for this attack is still under investigation. Uh, and the Russians are very uh, much pushing this. Uh, so I think the more we spread all of these things uh, to educate the base of Trump, uh, the better we can help to create a climate uh, so that he makes the right decision. You know, and I believe yes. that the included in the question there, we've got the concern about, you know, how could, how could Trump do this? I just wanted to point to how the LaRouche PAC 2018 election platform addresses this. The LaRouche PAC 2018 uh, platform is the campaign to win the future. And the three aspects of this, we can, we can pull up the image of that. The three aspects of this are one, a necessity of ending the coup against President Trump. Second, joining the Belt and Road Initiative, joining that outlook. And third, adopting LaRouche's four laws. It's not possible to do any of these things in isolation because these three aspects, ending the coup against Trump, joining the Belt and Road Initiative, and adopting LaRouche's four laws, if Trump is trying to join the Belt and Road Initiative, well, that's the whole reason that there's a coup against him in the first place. So part of that is trying to push him into situations where he feels that he needs to get some kind of support by doing what everyone's you know, asking him to do, in this case, uh, Syria. It's an example of how this constrains Trump's policy, even as it attempts to completely remove him from office. So we really have to take on all three of those at the same time in the United States to make it possible uh, for us to be part of, be part of this development. Our next question we're gonna take from New York. I believe by audio trouble, we're gonna be hearing this via the telephone system. So Alvin, you are up next. You could try standing at the mic there if they turn down the room audio so that we don't get feedback. And that way we could see you, Alvin. Or you can ask off camera as you like. There, Alvin? Yes, can you hear me? Sure can. Okay. Uh, hello, Helga. Uh, Alvin here in New York. Um, I've participated in the series, and it's the third class of the series that Dennis Baum uh, taught on the philosophy of geopolitics that uh, I think perhaps had the most stirring effect upon me, um, particularly uh, the Russell uh, portion that he wrote out there where you're very British where you're never quite sure uh, what he's saying and the effects uh, go largely and unintentionally uh, unnoticed that it has on us all. Uh, and it really, in thinking about this, becomes so clear why Lynn put the label on him as the most evil man of the 20th century. Uh, but in in moving on, it was Dennis's question on an example of win-win cooperation and what is the emotional state of mind involved uh, that stirred the most. Because at first I was thinking about this in the most simplest terms, and, and Dennis dealt with that problem. Uh, when I went a little deeper, I remembered our 9-11 memorial concert of 2016 particularly uh, that Sunday, the 11th, at St. Patrick's Co. Cathedral, where I was a member of the audience. And at one point throughout the entire uh, event, 
the archbishop asked each of us to turn to the side and shake the hand of the person next to them. Uh, you know, in one of Dennis's question was an example of win-win. Uh, and as I turned and did that, the entirety uh, of and, and the profound nature of what we were engaged in gripped me more deeply than I can never remember. Um, what happened was far more uh, than I ever expected. Uh, yes, my humanity was touched, but frankly, that ha happens often uh, when I'm working with this organization. But what went through me was all of humanity, a sense of, of that. Uh, and that was something completely new and uh, has, I thought, the best example of how you can defeat this type of uh, evil. Um, even with the new paradigm, how an individual can rise. Something that Lynn has talked about, and you always get that sense in, in you as well, of feeling that sense of duty and of being a part of all of humanity. That day, that happened for me, as I'm sure it did for many others. And it's something that without the class series, frankly, I had not made myself reflect upon to get the true meaning of it. Um, so that's what I wanted to, to share with you in terms of, for me at this point, what is a great series, but these thoughts continue to uh, flow through me as I interact with people. I'm absolutely convinced that we have, with the classical music in particular, classical culture in general, but especially the classical music, we have an instrument which can, you know, move people, move mountains. You know, we had just a cultural event in Dresden where, you know, I mean, we played, uh, we had a, a choral piece with a beautiful solo part in Russian, a folk song. Um, and then Frank Mattis, who, is, uh, who was presently in, in Dresden, he was singing some of the Klinka songs. And we had some Russians in the audience who were so flawed because, you know, in the present environment of anti-Russia phobia and attacks and demonization, then if they see that somebody of another culture is touching the most precious part of their own best traditions, it has an unbelievable effect. And, you know, one... One, one of these Russians told Frank Mattis um, afterwards, he said, I can't believe it. You are an American. You are an Afro-American and you are singing in Russian. You know, you are already the new paradigm united in one person. So I think, you know, the more we do these things, I think we have a tremendous uh, weapon, you know, because once you, you portray the beauty of the other culture and beauty... Uh, since it is something which Schiller explained is connected to reason. You know, Schiller doesn't have an arbitrary notion of beauty, but he says, I have a notion of, of beauty based on reason, and this is the yardstick with which I measure what I find in reality. That is something which is universally applicable. So either even if you have a Chinese poem or uh, an a song in a different language or a composition in you know coming from a different cultural background once it fulfills the requirement of beauty it's universal and once you touch that in the other culture and you you get it across i think that you know the the thing which is not yet totally defined because we are in the middle of it but i'm so absolutely certain that we are not only standing at the bridge of a new era, uh, you know, a new paradigm economically, development, overcoming poverty, but that also in the cultural domain and in the development of the maturity of, of mankind, that we are on the verge of a completely new era, which, you know, will be absolutely fantastic. And we will put our affairs, the affairs of governments, of nations, of peoples, on the most profound principles which are in cohesion with the lawfulness of the universe. And that will become the common identity of all people. 
So I think we are at an, at an absolutely unbelievable moment. And you know, the more people join this idea, I think we can make leaps and bounces and you know have a nonlinear development and experience a renaissance on a global scale in a very short period of time. Good. We're going to turn now to a couple of questions, one that came in online and one that came in um, via our Manhattan audience sent in by text. So let me turn first to our, our online question here. Somebody wrote back that I have often found that people don't seem to be aware that there is anything wrong with the old paradigm, like they're living in a bubble. Is it best to just change the subject in cases like that? Conversely, Others who are aware are so opinionated, you can't get a word in edgewise. So this is, <laughs> this is one of the responses to the organizing. And then let me go ahead and combine that with another one. Um, maybe in, I'll get, ask you to respond to both. The other question that came in was about China. So while much of the attacks uh, coming from the United States are very directly related to Russia right now, China is a all-weather partner of Russia. They're obviously completely close, completely seeing eye to eye strategically. And the attacks on China are occurring as well. One specific one is in regards to the Confucius Institutes, which are set up on US universities and teach Chinese language, calligraphy, art, this sort of thing. Senator Marco Rubio, for example, called for any college accepting money to set up a Confucius Institute should have that same amount of money of federal funding pulled back from them, essentially preventing the formation of any Confucius Institutes. And you might say, well, why is a cultural institution such a big threat? So uh, hoping you could respond to both our, uh, our feedback about dealing with people who are either in a bubble and see nothing wrong or have too many opinions, and also if you have any thoughts about the uh, attacks on the Confucius Institutes. Well, I think that the people who, who don't see anything wrong, um, you have to uh, get underneath what they are saying, you know, because what they're really saying is not that there is nothing wrong, it's just that they are belonging to a privileged part of society which wants to keep the status quo at the expense of uh, the rest of the world. I mean, anybody who is not seeing what is wrong with the present old paradigm, you know, the millions of people caused by humanitarian interventions, the absolute gap between the rich and the poor. I mean, anybody who doesn't see that is a moral moron. And, you know, I had uh, fortunately three German teachers who were all extremely polemical. Uh, and I met one of them many years afterwards and I thanked her. I said, look, if you wouldn't have be so polemical against us, um, you know, I would have never studied Schiller. I would have never done other things, which I am thankful for, for you for the rest of my life. So I think in cases of bubble, uh, you have to be polemical. I mean, that is not insight and you have to be careful not to mix the two things. But, you know, if you address the axiom, which is the basis of such a stupid uh, statement, you know, which is the idea of, you know, that uh, an oligarchical view that if you belong to a privileged class, it is okay if, if millions are suffering. I mean, you have to, to somehow get underneath the skin of such a person. And the opinionated people, well, I mean, it, it's just sometimes you have to say something very traumatic and even if they are opinionated for the next several months since our method which was really created by Linda Narouche as a scientific method um, I mean we have a record where people many years later say oh my god you said this uh, 30 years ago and now I can see that it's true uh, I think you have to just stick with it and in just thinking about it, you know, I mean, if you read some of the older papers by Lynn or what the organization put out, our Africa development plan from 1976, our plan for Latin America, working with Lopez Portillo at the beginning of the 80s, uh, things we wrote, um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, 
it's all coming true now. And while the number of people who know that is relatively limited, but there are there are many hundreds and even thousands of people all over the world who know that and who come now and acknowledge it. So once you are firm, knowing what you are saying is truthful, I wouldn't worry because some of the stupid people will get it last. Some of the more clever ones will get it first. But, you know, I mean, that's just how it is. And the problem in the West is that the very idea of truth seeking is, is lost. You, you do not have as a cultural value the idea that people should look for the truth. As a matter of fact, you know, once you say that, that you are a truth seeking person, you have some idiot coming from certain Hannah Arendt or other uh, <clears throat> backgrounds who, who of 68 or, or Frankfurt School who say that if you pretend to look for the truth, you are already an authoritarian character because that's what they did to prevent exactly people from doing that. And that, by the way, is one of the reasons why the Confucius Institutes are being attacked by these liberals because Confucius, as Schiller, as Plato, as Cusanus, as Leibniz, all of these great minds had the idea that there is a knowable truth. And you know, while you will never reach the perfect truth, that the search for truth is what counts in all fields, in science, in music, in art. And you know, I will never forget the words of Norbert Breinin, who was the first violinist of the Amadeus Quartet, who said that the only way how you get the greatness of Beethoven's music is you have to be a true seeking person and you have to work on the composition so long until you are sure that you have reached the greatest possible truthfulness at this point. So it's really one and the same thing because the neoliberal uh, miseducation of the West uh, was exactly that people wouldn't have this inner strength to you know, develop their own mental abilities, their own, own intellectual capability to have a measuring rod for the truth. Because if every opinion is equal to the next, well, then truth goes out of the window. So I think we should make polemics against people like Marco Rubio and not allow him to do what he's doing because you know this is this is a form of um, cultural uh, warfare. He puts himself on on the same line like the Gang of Four in China, and um, you know he should be reformed. <laughs> All right. Well, we've got uh, several more questions that are coming in. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to read a short comment that came in online. We're going to take a question from one of the audience members in New York. And then we have another online question that we're going to go to. And then maybe we'll see how much uh, what, what your time's looking like, Helga, at that point. That might be a wrap up. So let's. Uh, this comment just came in during the class series. Our friend wrote in, hi. Would just like to thank the Schiller Institute and LaRouche organization for this incredible class series, which has not only been free, but shows us a whole new universe. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. To which I'd respond, you're very welcome. And thank you for what you've been doing. This person's been very active. And also, although the class is free, we do very much appreciate and need your contributions. So please contribute to LaRouche Pack so that we can succeed in making all of this happen. We rely on you. We don't get any money except from individual contributions. No corporate donations are accepted. It's you. Please help. Let's turn now to our audience member in New York, who I believe will be asking a question via telephone. Hello, Pat, can you hear us? Hi. Um, yes, I can. Can you hear me? Yes. Go right ahead. OK. My name is uh, Sister Pat Connick, and I've been a member of the Schiller Institute Chorus here in Manhattan for the past two years. I'm also a chemistry high school teacher here um, in the city. And this really segues to what Helga had just been talking about in terms of education. So um, my observation is that, and I'm sure yours as well, the potential of, of human society resonates into individuals' potentials and vice versa, our environment changes us and we evolve our surroundings. So the economic development associated with the new Silk Road 
will definitely have a positive impact on the lives of, of billions of individuals. And Helga, could you please speak to the efforts of the LaRouche Pact to influence what happens uh, for, uh, and in the education of individuals in our public and private schools, especially here in the United States? And I'm thinking in particular about um, what, what I think you were starting to talk about, a return to a more Renaissance education based on the values of um, truth and goodness and beauty. Thank you. Well, I think that what we are attempting to do with this class series uh, is uh, an example, you know, because as you probably uh, could see, um, you know, we are not focusing on um, subjects separated from each other, but, you know, the, it's, it's all part of, of one, universal history, philosophy, natural science, music, uh, poetry, art, the arts, it's all the same process leading to, you know, the development of the creative potential of the individual. And I think that that is, um, you know, something which, you know, you really have to go back to the Humboldt education system, which, you know, happens to be very similar to what Confucius was teaching or the collaboration between Schiller and, and Humboldt. It's the idea that there are certain subjects which are more suited to have a positive impact on the beauty of the character of the pupil or the student. Uh, Humboldt, for example, who developed um, the best education system, at least for the European cultural areas, had the idea that the aim of education is not knowledge, it's not to know your subject, to make examinations and get good points. But the aim is to learn how to study, to learn how to improve your knowledge and to become a beautiful character. So Humboldt said that it was the universal history, uh, that it was the command of the own language in its highest expression, which means you have to study the poets, uh, in English, you would study Shakespeare and Edgar Allan Poe and, and, and many others. Uh, in German, you would study uh, Schiller, Goethe, uh, Lessing, uh, Mörike, others, because only what you can express metaphorically, uh, you can communicate. Uh, and only what you can express with your language do you really understand. So universal history, the command of your own language, the natural sciences, music, uh, other languages, all of these things have to be, have to come together. But the aim is not these things in themselves, but the aim is that the character becomes beautiful. Now that is something which has been completely eliminated from the curriculum and nobody even speaks about it. But I think that if you look at the violence in the schools, if you look at the terrible opium epidemic, if you look at the, you know, the self image of many of the young people, you know, where young women are, you know, really dressed up like little whores, where, you know, young men, I have a terrible conception of, of what a woman is. Uh, all of these things, you know, are really a reflection that the idea of education having an effect on the beauty of the character is, is absent. So I think that, you know, we have to put these things back. And, you know, I think the only way how you get it is that people have to understand that you need this kind of new paradigm of a moral society. And, you know, people attack Xi Jinping as an authoritarian uh, candidate. Um, but, you know, in reality, what he is doing, he's sp spreading uh, a Confucian Renaissance in China he is spreading the outlawing of hip hop. I mean, they just had a huge um, attack on hip hop. Why? Because hip hop has, uh, you know, pornographic content, a low level of, of women, uh, of violence, and China is just moving against hip hop. I find this very good. They are also moving against banal quiz shows. Uh, I mean, I don't know how spread this is in the United States. In Germany, you have tons of these idiotic quiz shows 
where people ask questions and as more difficult the question becomes, the more high the return is of the possible winning. So you have entire industries of people who are producing books and videos where you can learn by heart, you know, how did the following soccer team play in 1923 in the third round against such other uh, country? And then you learn that to make your point. What has this to do with real knowledge? Absolutely nothing. So China is moving against banal quiz shows. Anyway, I think we have to have a situation where more people become rebel rousers against the illness in society. And, you know, that is part of the new Silk Road spirit and it's part of the mass movement for development. It all goes together. If I might add a little bit to that too, specifically on the question of education, the emphasis that LaRouche has placed, London LaRouche has placed on a reform of education is a need to go back both to original sources and to the method of Socrates as described by Plato, the, the method of dialectic where so much of what occurs in education is answering, giving answers where there is no question. That is giving students things to remember where they've never been provoked to even consider those topics as something worth thinking about. Um, you know, in chemistry, for example, people you know learn these formulas, they apply them on their, their practice examples. Instead, if things began with experiments that required a concept to understand them, that would be a much better approach. And that's in chemistry, but in general, uh, that's the way to do things. In chemistry, you often do at least get some laboratory work, so you have some idea that your thoughts really do cohere with the physical world. But why not start with those and then make the questions that are answered necessary questions? So we turn next to a question that has come in from one of our online viewers. Um, we'll put her question up on the screen. This is a question from Florida. Our friend writes in, hello, I am wondering if there is an option for the average working citizens of the US and the world to move our savings from the transatlantic banking system into the banking system of the new paradigm, the one belt, one road banking system. With all the banks that were set up for the BRICS, one belt, one road, etc., it seems like a good idea to have the option for us average working people to be able to move our savings from the shaky transatlantic banks where we might lose those savings into a more stable banking system. And then these savings would be able to help support the new paradigm, the one belt, one road, and the world's future. So do you have any advice to our questioner, Helga? <laughs> well, <clears throat> I, I'm, not, um, I'm not advising you against uh, probing that. Uh, because we are sitting on the <clears throat> on the potential new outbreak like 2008, but much, much worse. If even the Federal Reserve is warning of that, um, we better should take note. Um, <clears throat> but that is obviously not the solution. As I said, you know, I'm not I'm not telling you not to do it because, you know, if it's possible, I don't know. I've never investigated that. Um, why not? But I would also say very, very strongly that that does not solve the problem. Uh, like in World War II, you had the famous family which uh, moved to a remote island to escape World War II, and then that is where the bombs hit the worst. So, you know, I mean, we have to save civilization in the places where we are. I mean, the United States is admittedly a difficult uh, country right now. And, you know, you have for the first time a falling life expectancy for two years in a row in all categories of age. Now, if there's any parameter of a collapsing society, it is the collapse of life expectancy. And, you know, I don't need to tell you about the infrastructure in, in New York, New Jersey. If you have a little Italian Fiat 500, don't drive over American highways because you are at risk of vanishing in one of the potholes. So I'm not saying this is an ideal situation, but you have to have at the same time the absolute commitment to make America great again. And I don't mean it the way Trump means it. I mean it, you know, America once was uh, a, beacon of, a beacon of hope 
um, you know, a temple of liberty. The whole world looked towards, towards the American Revolution, the American Constitution, the American Declaration of Independence. With John Quincy Adams, America had the idea of an alliance of perfectly sovereign nation states. I mean, that is what the win-win Chinese uh, New Silk Road is offering today. But America has been taken over in terms of its establishment a lot by the British imperial system. And Trump, you know, is in a daily battle against that. So I think that, you know, if I would be an American, I would really try to think of ways to rebuilding America as a great nation. And I have said this in the past, if America would now uh, join with these other nations, Russia, China, India, and the Silk Road countries, and show the kind of you know, win-win cooperation, doing something for the countries, America could have all the friends in the world again. It doesn't have to be like that, where you know, self-righteous people all over the world are totally anti-American, in part for the right reasons, but many times for the wrong reasons, because why they did not object against the uh, interventionist wars of Bush and Obama, they are now uh, against Trump, because Trump is upsetting the establishment. So, you know, it's, a, it's an unsettled question, but America should be a pearl in the necklace of nations again. And I would really strongly suggest to you that you not only think about what you do with your personal saving, but help us to implement the four laws. If the class deagle, the national bank, the credit system, the joining with the belt and road system comes on the table, you can safely keep your money in the United States and you save your country at the same time. Yeah. Certainly, for those concerned about their their savings and wanting to, I mean, very good question, and wanting to invest it in something productive for the future, uh, we can offer a very specific bit of investment advice, not investment advice here, which is to donate to LaRouche Pack, presuming you're an American citizen or permanent resident. Uh, you can do that at lpac.co slash donate. And I assure you that investing in transforming the United States so that it's the future that you are really going to be proud of is one of the best investments that you can make with your, your savings and acting to make that happen is a wonderful way to invest your time. So we have two more, can you take two more questions, Helga? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, we're gonna turn next to New York. So uh, I believe Jane Bloomer is going to be asking a question by telephone, and then we are going to be turning to Keisha Rogers in Houston for the, uh, for, the, for the last question to you. So let's go to New York. Jane Bloomer, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Sure can. Go right ahead. Very good. As I am a social worker and I'm trained in the soft sciences and social sciences and in working locally. This is all fine, well and good. But so I have to admit, I was hesitant about taking the LaRouche science class because I, uh, the hard sciences have always challenged me. But what was most exciting about it was that uh, my brain expanded, my thinking expanded, and I di discovered some new concepts and new principles, but I also rediscovered principles and understood them better. So um, actually, uh, at a class last week, I had a eureka experience, experience about a four to three ratio. So what, I, what comes to my mind uh, as I think locally, and also what China is doing in reducing poverty, and thinking if they could do it, why on earth are we not doing it on a national scale? And uh, of course, rediscovering all the you know all that has been done in American history in the past, and and redeveloping and redeveloping agriculture and industry and infrastructure. So uh, how I'm going to approach someone locally about considering being a candidate uh, for LaRouche. So, uh, and I'm interested, and I'm also feeling more fired up to be able to stand up for 
uh, stand with more um, assuredness, uh, understanding things from a, a science, the science of physical economy. Uh, so I could use any tips that um, uh, Mrs. LaRouche has to suggest, or you, Jason, or, or Ben. Well, Did I, I think that, uh, no, uh, I think that one good way, I mean, I, one polemic which we are using uh, in Europe and actually in an election campaign in, in Hessen, um, and we, we had a resolution at the last Schiller Institute conference in Frankfurt in November, where we basically said if China can have uh, the aim to eliminate alleviate poverty in China completely until the year 2020. I mean, that's less than two years, you know, um, from now. Um, China has now 30 million poor people left. The European Union has 90 million poor people left. But there is absolutely no effort by the European Union or the European government to have such a name. So we formulated a resolution saying that, that if China can eliminate poverty uh, until 2020, uh, so should Europe be able to do that. And I think you should do the same thing in, in America. Uh, because then the question comes, you know, how do you overcome poverty? And then you are immediately at the question of productive jobs uh, and infrastructure and agriculture and, and so forth. So I think the idea that poverty is not something which is part of the laws of the universe or even there to be forever is something, you know, once people think about it, that China is, is, has lifted 700 million people out of poverty and therefore has all the credibility that it will be able to reach the goal of getting rid of poverty until 2020 in China and even has committed itself to contribute to eliminate poverty on the whole planet, I think the year 2030 or something. Uh, why can we not do the same thing? And I think that that you know, is something very tangible and very concrete so people can get uh, a sensuous connection on a local level. Uh, and then you, you use that to expand their view to the broader issues to actually how to accomplish it. And I think as a pedagogy, I found, uh, and not only me, but we found that this is a, a very good way to approach this question. Turn after one uh, more appeal from our sponsors, which is that we're very happy that a number of the participants in this class series, a number of the students have made contributions to support this class series and to make it possible to host the next one. If you have not yet made a contribution and you are legally able to do so, please do so. lpac.co slash donate. So you can go to lpac.co slash donate to make sure that we're able to win this fight. We're going to turn now, I believe, to our final question for the event which is from Houston, Texas. Go ahead, Keisha. Okay. Well, as I was sitting here reflecting on the course of development of this entire class series and thinking about the direction of what is required right now, what has to happen in order for this new paradigm, in order for this new direction for mankind to be realized in order for LaRouche's four laws uh, and America's future on the new Silk Road in the new paradigm to be, to be realized. Uh, I think it's really important and I would like for you to really express this Helga as we're wrapping up the entirety of this series of class, this class series, the, that you're not gonna have this new paradigm with the British Empire and geopolitics still in existence. We're at a moment right now that the end of geopolitics and the end of the British Empire must happen. And secondly, I would like to address the fact that as we're looking at what lies at the foundation, at the heart of LaRouche's four laws, you, you really look back at our fight for the true American system, 
what this conception of the American system represents, what's at the heart of LaRouche's four, four laws. And this is something I just wanted to go back to that President Trump, at the beginning of his campaign before the onslaught, uh, or really which led up to the onslaught of this uh, coup and this witch hunt against the president, is that for the first time you had a president who expressed the interest, interest of a revival of the true conception of an American system, uh, discussing Henry Carey, Lincoln, the American system, uh, fair trade policies. But I think it's, it's more than that. I think that if this is going to be realized once and for all, the understanding that the American system is the antithesis, the complete opposition to the British imperial system of free trade, to the system, uh, British imperial system of enslavement, of poverty, of keeping nations backwards, that this president, the American people, have to realize that, as Lincoln said, you can't have a, a world half slave and half free. And what that means is half under the control of the British Empire and the imperial system and half moving towards a new paradigm. So now is the time that we have to move the United States and Europe and the rest of the world towards the new paradigm. And at the heart of LaRouche's four laws is what he described as, and what you've really beautifully laid out here today, as the unleashing of the divine spark of reason, uh, the creative discovery, the creative potential of every single human being. And this is what the American system is about. It's not just about economic policies and solutions, but you have to get at the heart of what it really is to be human. So I just wanted to conclude with that and to ask you to comment on it, because I think in pulling the whole discussion back together again, we're at a very vital moment where the new paradigm for mankind can be realized, but it's not going to be done without the fight that once and for all this, this enemy, this British empire has to be eliminated, eliminated once and for all. Well, I think the reason why uh, the British are so completely freaked out as it was, um, you know, demonstrated in the Russia Gate. I mean, you, you had an incredible, um, you know, the British had to, to reveal an incredible um, weak flank. You know, now the British government is exposed of having had collusion with the intelligence heads of the intelligence services of the Obama administration in a coup attempt against uh, an elected American president. I mean, that is not yet off the table. And we know that many of the congressional committees uh, were starting to look in particular at the role of MI6, Christopher Steele, the fact that the British Foreign Office intervened on behalf of Steele in a British court case, which was launched by the Russian mentioned in, in the Steele dossier, so there is still this question, you know, that there was a coup attempt involving the British government against a sitting president. So, you know, I think this is a perfect opportunity to remind people that the American Revolution was fought against that British empire. And, you know, that's why I said we should really make sure that we put out all these reports, uh, Sakharova, Zuma, Taror, maybe an updated version of the, uh, the fall of the House of Windsor, uh, with including these new uh, elements, so that the people are being educated again, you know, that the British is essentially the, the enemy, uh, at least, you know, not the British <coughs> population, but the British establishment for sure. So <coughs> I think that that is um, uh, one thing. And obviously, the other thing is that you know, the biggest danger I see right now, or one of the biggest danger, is you could have a collapse of the financial system anytime. If one of the three governors of the Federal Reserve is warning that the present wave of corporate insolvencies in the United States, which is 60% up as compared to last year, could trigger a new banking crisis uh, at any moment. I think this should give us a renewed 
impetus to fight for the four laws because if you don't put in Klaus Stiegel in time and if you have a new crash before that, as a matter of fact, you know, we talked to some uh, very well-placed European uh, insider in the financial system who said that he has uh, gotten wind of that some circles may even pull down the financial system to pull the carpet under away from, from Trump to put the neocons back in, in office. And I think this is really to be taken serious and should really energize us and everybody else uh, to go with the class Deagle and four laws before it is too late. Now, the four laws indeed would put an end to that. So, you know, I, I really would urge you to, to amplify not only your own efforts, but be courageous, be polemical, don't respect stupid opinions, but just get out the message uh, because this is an un unbelievable battle of our lifetime. I would just like to add to um, Jason's uh, appeals one thing. I mean, those people who are part of this discussion or will be part of future discussions who are not Americans, uh, they should join the Schiller Institute because we are right now trying to expand the Schiller Institute as an international both think tank producing solutions for all kinds of crises, both economically, culturally, and, and in any other field, but also to create a mass movement internationally for a Renaissance movement. So you can join not only the Schiller course, but you also can join the Schiller Institute, uh, especially you know, when your status is such that you would not necessarily uh, be an American and part of a political action committee, because the Schiller Institute is our wider ranging international effort it does exist in organizational form in many countries in different forms. Some are friends of the Schiller Institute, others are established organizations. But you know, the idea of an international Renaissance movement spreading these ideas, you can greatly help by becoming an active member also on an international level. So I think you should really enjoy what you I'm very happy about many of the contributions, especially when people, you know, communicate how your thinking has expanded, how your brain is is functioning on a on a higher level or deeper level. And that is actually what human nature is. So the experience of discovering something new and continue to do that is already the key to creativity. Because learning and teaching should never be the same, but you should always add something new. And there is such a thing as life, lifelong learning, which is actually a Confucian virtue. And, you know, Benjamin Franklin was an absolute pupil of Confucius, and he based his own moral teachings absolutely on Confucius. So this is a, a very basic American idea, which you should all uh, cherish and, and spread around. Thank you very much. I think uh, we're all, I think all of our audiences join me in thanking you, Helga, for being with us today and sharing your insights. It's very much appreciated. I'd just like to close by summarizing a few aspects of this class series and, and an idea of, of where we go from here. You know, I think that during this, uh, just the class today, for example, we heard from three congressional candidates. We heard from activists all over the world. We heard from people who were handing out leaflets. We heard from people who were attending events and speaking about the Belt and Road Initiative. We heard about people who were translating Kuza into Arabic. So there's so many things that you can do and we are so active and we would be an excellent we're, we're the best way for you to for you to make a, a change in the world. I mean, things like the uh, LaRouche Pack Robert Mueller dossier. This has been absolutely essential in making it possible to end the coup against the president, without which we'll never be able to join the Belt and Road Initiative. We have from EIR, the New Silk Road Becomes the World Land Bridge report for your lifetime learning about what the potential is around the world and a new version of this coming out soon. We've had specific follow-on reports, such as the one about Southwest Asia and Africa, available through the Schiller Institute. And we're working now on an updated version of our platform about LaRouche's four laws and about the LaRouche Pact 2018 campaign 
for America's future. So just through this class series itself, we've had several dozen students who have reached out through the class series site and made a contribution. And I ask everybody able to join them, contribute to the LaRouche Pack. If you're not able to contribute to the LaRouche Pack, please support the Schiller Institute. And uh, we look very much forward to what comes next. There will be a survey sent out in your email uh, to all registered students after this class. We'll be sending it out next week. Please take the time to fill it out, to give us feedback about what would be, uh, what worked, what you'd like to see, and very importantly, what kind of activity you're able to engage in so that we can work together and make all of this happen. So from uh, LaRouche Pack, Ben and I are very happy to have gone on this journey through three months of classes with you with so many teachers and our special guest, Helga Sepp LaRouche, who I'd like to thank again. And uh, with that, we'll wrap up the 2018 LaRouche Pack class series on what is the new paradigm. Thanks for joining. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for your future activity. Thanks in advance. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Oh,